So far, this pretty face has been the mascot of the terrifying placoderms and the age of the fish. But recently he's gone through slightly embarrassing change. You, uh, you feeling a little cold there, buddy? So let's take an in-depth and updated look into Dunkleosteus. Now Dunkleosteus has long been enigmatic to say the least. Even though this genus has been known for around 150 years, we've only really known about its head with regards to what it looks like. Well, up until this year, but I will be getting into that. The first remains were found all the way back in 1867 by an amateur fossil hunter named Jay Terrell along the lake cliffs of Cleveland, Ohio. But these were originally assigned as a species of Dinichthys. It wasn't actually until 1956 that Dunkleosteus was recognised as its own genus. The genus name was actually in honour of David Dunkel, who was the former curator of vertebrate paleontology of the Cleveland Museum, and it's since become a bit of a fossil mascot for Cleveland. So what was this fever dream Nemo actually like in life? Well, it depends on what species you're talking about. You see, Dunkleosteus is the genus, and not specific. In fact, many people think of their favourite dinosaur as a single type of animal, but the only commonly known species is a Tyrannosaurus rex. I do have a full video explaining this, but long story short, animals within a single genus can differ quite a bit, and there are currently 10 recognised species of Dunkleosteus. The type species, or the first one described, is Dunkleosteus terrili, which is named after the fossil hunter that first discovered the remains. This guy is the biggest and most well-known species. So for the sake of being concise in getting across as much info as possible about the genus, this is the species that I'll be talking about mostly in this video. Now, Dunkleosteus remains that have been found over the years have mostly been restricted to the cranial armour, meaning we've long known almost everything about the skull and not much else behind the neck. So, let's start with the head. Dunkleosteus, as a placoderm, had a heavily armoured head, with bony plates being dermal protection with points of articulation that allow for very clever movement. You may have noticed that the jaw of Dunkleosteus looks quite different. This tankfish didn't technically have teeth. Instead, the gnashers were actually extended blades of this dermal armour. These bad boys were made for slicing and nothing else. There was no point in having any chewing utensils because Dunkleosteus wasn't actually capable of this. Instead, the jaws of this fish were what is known as a four-bar linkage system, which is essentially where you have a closed chain mechanism and there are four bodies, or bars, that are interconnected with each other for a single concise movement. This is seen in many modern fish and allows not only for an extraordinarily quick opening of the jaws, but also for the jaws to project forwards rather than just opening and shutting. So how exactly did Dunkleosteus utilise this? Well, the jaws opening this quickly, which was estimated to be around 20 milliseconds, would have caused a momentary vacuum within the mouth, with the water pouring in and sucking in anything in close proximity. The jaws would help get that little bit closer before slicing in half whatever unfortunate soul was between them. An extra bit of proficiency would have been added at the close of the jaws as well, since these two blades would have sheared against each other, meaning they were essentially self-sharpening. And the power of this bite? Well, it was around 5,363 newtons at the blade's edge, or around 1,200 pounds. This is actually powerful enough to break through any mineralised hard part of any organism. 
Likely meaning that the kind of food that Dunkleosteus would have used this mechanism on was varied. From large invertebrates to other placoderms and even cartilaginous fish. Now this last one's quite interesting because it was once thought that cartilaginous fish were a lot quicker and more agile than the placoderms, which led to them outcompeting those said placoderms. But this could, could mean that this theory is wrong. The main bit of confusion that has always been present with Dunkleosteus is what is going on behind that chunky head. Because of this, phylogenetic bracketing has been used with the closest related placoderms to estimate what the body may have looked like. But even this has led to some widely varying estimates, leading to various tails and uncertainty with the shape and placement of the dorsal fins. The biggest question mark though has always been the overall size of the creature with estimates being anywhere from 13 to 33 feet long for a fully grown individual. This isn't down to confusing juvenile specimens either, since they have also been found showing proportional differences, but still producing the same proportional numbers. So I guess we'll never know. Oh yeah, my cheeky little hook at the beginning. In just February of this year, Russell K. Engelman proposed a new theory of estimating the overall size of Dunkleosteus. Engelman noticed a correlation between the overall length of many more complete placoderms as well as living fish and the orbit opercular length or the distance between the front of the eye hole and the back of the head. Using these metrics, Engelman came out with some very different numbers. Whilst his weight estimates were a lot heavier at between 2,000 and 3,880 pounds, as opposed to the previous estimates of 1,500 pounds, the actual length actually came out a lot shorter, at just 13.5 feet for the largest individual. Now, no body shaming our boy here, but he may have been a lot shorter and a lot fatter than we initially thought. Which now raises a few questions. Now fish morphology is governed more by feeding niche than actual phylogeny, hence the previous comparisons to great white sharks. So with these new length and weight estimations, drag dynamics and locomotion were likely very different to what we thought as well. With answers comes more questions. As to the environment that Dunkleosteus was swimming around in, well, it lived around 382 to 358 million years ago in the seas of the Lake Devonian. It just so happens that I have a video on that here. So what do you think that these new size estimates would mean for the locomotion of Dunkleosteus? I'd love to read your discussions and comments below. Please leave a like on your way out and I'll catch you guys next time.